God's rich blessing be to his word, may it be sanctified in our hearts. Father, we thank you for your word. We know your word brings to us hope, encouragement, strength, wisdom, insight, perspective. Speak a good word to us today that we might be spiritually enriched, that our minds will be sharpened and calibrated to entertain great and wonderful thoughts about you. And we might be to serve you with a greater zeal, fervor, determination, and resolve. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> May be seated in the presence of the Lord, and I want to uh, talk this morning from this simple subject, from frustration to full faith. From frustration to full faith, and we're going to be looking in the narrative from uh, Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 14. I was watching a commercial the other day, and you've seen it many times, and I meant to write down the name of it, but it's this swimming pool that you can put in your house. It doesn't take up much space. But the thing about the pool is you can't go anywhere. You just continue to stroke in one place. And it has this current coming at you that keeps you from moving forward. Sure, you've seen this, right? You've seen it. What is it called? OK, in the pool? Endless pool. Endless pool. It's an endless pool, but you don't go nowhere. You just go in one spot, you just stroke away for dear life and you can turn up faster and you can stroke faster, but you don't move. And as I watched, I said, well, who in the world would want an endless pool that you did not go anywhere? You just stayed in the same spot. But as I thought about it, I said, it's all, well, it's all dependent on what you're trying to accomplish. Now, if you're trying to swim across the Gulf of Mexico, then you may want to be able to see how far you can get before you get out in the Gulf of Mexico. But if you're just trying to strengthen your cardiovascular system, if you're just trying to build up your stamina, if you're just trying to lose some weight and you're trying to be more healthy, it makes a whole lot of sense to have an endless pool because you can't get many people in it. Therefore, you got to worry about everybody trying to come and get in the pool. I think you can have many, maybe two people in the pool at a time or whatever. But the more I watch, I said, this is pretty ingenuous. But people really like to swim for exercise. And I've been told that swimming is probably one of the best cardiovascular exercises that you can get. Because not only is it a cardio workout, but your muscles and your joints and all these things have been exercised. And unlike jogging and lifting weights and all that type of business and Zumba, and all that type of business, it's not hard on your joints because you've been buoyed by the water. So I've been told by some physicians, it's the best possible exercise that one could get. So everybody should go out and buy an endless pool. I've just invested in the stock, I'm only kidding. My point is, as I looked at that, I began to realize that that's somewhat of an analogy. It's some of an illustration of where we are sometime in life. There are times in life that it appears that we're not getting anywhere. We got a lot of motion, a lot of kicking, a lot of arms wailing around, a lot of stroking, but we do not appear to be making any progress. And that can be extremely frustrating. The only point is it all depends upon what it is that God is trying to do in our lives. If we're just kicking away and failing away at our own, but if God is involved in this, it may just be that God is using what appears to be these frustrating situations and circumstances that's causing us to exert all of this energy and all of this effort. We didn't raise our head and we haven't made any progress. But if God has been using the current against us to build up our spiritual cardiovascular system, to strengthen our spiritual muscle, to tone us, and to prepare us what he has up ahead for us, then it's not all a waste of time. It might appear. 
and others who have observed us might appear that it is a waste of time. But God, who has a divine plan for all of our lives, may very well know how he's using this situation. This is a fitting introduction for this text. Whether we look in Mark chapter 6, Matthew chapter 14, both Mark and Matthew, they're recording the same incident. Matthew just provides us some additional insight, and that's why we have to look at Matthew's gospel. This particular story comes at the heels after Jesus had performed the stupendous miracle of multiplying the fishes and the loaves to feed the 5,000 men plus the women and children, over 20,000 people were fed on a few pieces of fish and from a few loaves. And this miracle really had been pretty powerful in the eyes of the disciples because after they had finished feeding all the people, there were 12 baskets that was left over. Each of the disciples had their own baskets. Surely their faith has been strengthened as a result of this supernatural miracle. On the heels of that, Jesus says to them, okay, get in the boat. You guys go on over to the other side. I'll meet you later. And so Jesus goes up into the mountains to pray, as he would often do. He would retreat away from the disciples, retreat away from the hustle and the bustle of the activity to go and have some quiet time in prayer with the Father, that he might be strengthened, that he might be equipped to continue the work that God had for him to do. Now, if you pick up the narrative there, In Matthew's gospel, in verse 23, we find that he goes from the mountain to pray. The evening now comes. Verse 24, they're in the ship, and they're trying to navigate their way to the other side in the midst of the sea. And now they're being tossed, and they're being driven by the waves that are boisterous against them. And the text says that the wind is contrary to to them. The wind is coming at them. It's in their face. And so they're rowing, but they're not making any progress. And I'm sure, I'm sure that some of the disciples were thinking, well, why has he sent us out here to die? Remember, there was a similar situation in Mark chapter 4, where he said, let us go over to the other side. But this time, he was in the boat with them. And as they get out in the boat and the storms rise, the winds are blowing, the waves are beating upon the boat. But the second time, he's not in the boat with them. And so they are roaring for all it's worth, but they're not making any progress. And that's the way it is sometime in life. We sometimes conclude because something is difficult, because there is resistance to what we're trying to do, because there is opposition to us, that maybe God is not in it, that God has abandoned us, or that we're just on our own. But very often, it is quite to the contrary. The fact that there is resistance and opposition and friction that's trying to keep you from moving forward may very well be the evidence that God really is in it. And sometimes the resistance, the opposition is coming from the enemy, from Satan the demonic hope or Satan working through people in situations or circumstances. But sometimes it is merely a part of God's spiritual calisthenics, of God's aerobics, of God's endless pool that he's placed us in because God knows what he has for us to do in the future, but in the present we're not spiritually strong enough. We do not have the cardiovascular endurance. We do not have the muscle tension and tone to do the work that God has for us to do in the future. So God has placed us in a gymnasium in the present that he might cause us to have to exercise and to put forth effort so that we develop the type of endurance that we're going to need for the future. So don't despise the opposition. Don't despise the resistance. You've got to listen closely to the Lord. Say, Lord, what lesson would you have me to learn during this situation? I've shared with you in the past, I'll repeat it many times before I depart from here. When you go to school, a good teacher 
will give you the lesson first, the information first. And after the teacher has laid out the lesson, the information, then the teacher will give you the quiz, the test, the examination to see how much you have learned that he or she has taught. But in God's economy, he didn't work like that. God gives you the test first. You have the test first in God's classroom, and after you've had the test, God then wants to know what lesson did you learn from the test. Now, if you don't learn the lesson the first time, God does not believe in social promotion. You know, this book, so we believe in social promotion. We don't want no 17-year-olds in the fifth grade. So it doesn't matter whether you can read or not. You don't have to be a computer. We're just going to move you on in. We're just going to promote you on. We're just going to socially promote you. But in God's school, he will not socially promote you. You could be 55 with a lollipop in the pre-kindergarten spiritual class. God will let you stay right there in spiritual kindergarten till you demonstrate to him that you've learned the lesson from the test that he's placed before you. Don't despise the opposition. Don't despise the resistance. Don't think just because you're in a hard place right now, a difficult spot right now, that God is not with you. The disciples could have easily concluded that. But God was very much with them, and he had sent them on this excursion. He wanted them to have this frustration. Sometimes it requires us being frustrated to realize we can't do things in our own strength, in our own effort. We don't have the wisdom, the knowledge. We just don't have all the pieces to the puzzle. So we got to become totally frustrated with life to where we say, Lord, now what are you trying to teach me? What lesson do I need to learn? What am I not doing that you want me to do? What am I doing that I shouldn't be doing? It's sometimes it's the frustration of life that brings us to that point. So the disciples, I guarantee you, they, they were frustrated. And so the Bible says, in the midst of their frustration, with the wind being contrary to them, they expended all of this energy and effort, but they're not making any real progress. Verse 26, and then Jesus comes walking on the water, on the sea. And the Bible says they were troubled. That is a King James way of saying they were scared to death. They were scared to death. As a matter of fact, just having ate all the fish and the loaves, they may have had an accident right there in the boat. Because if I was in a boat and the winds were blowing and the waves were crashing in the boat and I saw somebody walking on the water going by me, it's hard to tell what might happen. So the Bible says they were afraid, they were traumatized, they were fearful over this, what in the world is going on? So they thought it was a spirit. Some time of a ghost or something like that. You know, there, was a, there was an incredible movie that came down the pike, and it, it didn't really take hold here, but on the video, it's going to be a big hit. So when it come out on the video, you need to get this movie. It's called The Life of Pi. Anybody see it? It's, it's, one, one, it's an incredible movie. And, and from, the, from the preview, you would have thought it's something silly like Gulliver's Travel or something like that, but it really was. It was about a journey of faith. A powerful journey of faith of this Hindi, Hindu Indian boy. You got to watch this movie. It's extremely, extremely powerful. And as I was watching the movie, I thought about this text because so much of the movie takes place with him inside this raft. You got to watch this thing. And what he endured in this raft, floating in the Pacific somewhere with a tiger in the raft with him. And he's trying to survive the tiger and the wind and the sea and the sharks and everything he got to deal with. And I thought about this text where you got to watch this movie so I can talk to you about it. In the midst of all of this struggle, these disciples, Jesus shows up. And that is the way it is sometimes. When we feel like all oh, this loss, there's no way it can get any better. We don't know which way we're going to turn out of nowhere. The Lord will show up through someone with a testimony, someone with a word, a sermon, or a song, or the situation will change. But we may not immediately recognize it as the Lord. So he shows up to calm their fears. And then the Bible in verse 27 says, but straightway Jesus spoke to them and he said, be of good cheer, hip hip hooray, don't be afraid. It's I, be not afraid. And the Lord, he can still our fears. He can calm our anxieties. In the midst of the sickness of a loved one, the death of a loved one, the rebellion of a child, the loss of a job, an 
unexpected diagnosis from a physician, the Lord can dispel, dispel our fears and bring us a sense of peace and tranquility. So he says, be of good cheer, it is I. But our man Simon Peter said, Lord, if it's really you, verse 28, he said, let, let me come out there with you. You can walk on water and you'll be to enable me to be to walk on water. So we see the disciples' frustration, their fear, and now you see Peter's faith. And the only thing that can really help us to manage our frustration and our fear is our faith in the living God in his power to sustain us and to keep us from falling, in his power and his promises to never leave us nor forsake us. And so Peter decides to exercise his faith. He says to the Lord, if it be you, Lord, then let me come out there with you. So the first thing I see about Peter's faith is first of all, enable him to do the impossible. Now I'm not suggesting that you go out here this morning and try to walk on the canal. I wouldn't suggest that. I wouldn't suggest that. You can do it if you want to. I'll stand there with a, with a life preserver and I'll toss it to you. Maybe we can get you out before you suffer from hypothermia. I wouldn't suggest that. We don't presume upon God. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord our God. But this was a unique situation. So Jesus is physically there with his disciples. He's trying to grow and strengthen their faith. They're having these experiences because he knows the work that he has for them to do after his departure. So they're in a unique, a unique school of training and discipline and preparation. So in the presence of the Lord, he does the impossible. Peter gets out the boat and he starts to walk on the water. And someone says, well, they can walk on water too if you know where all the rocks are. I believe this is a real miracle and I don't know how God really did it, but God is able to do exceedingly abundantly for all we could ask or think. So Peter walks on the water. He does the impossible and he does it by faith because he is responding to the words of Jesus Christ. By faith he believes and he starts to walk. He does the impossible. Then in the midst of doing the impossible, he did the conceivable. He started to think about what he was doing. Verse 29 or 30. But when he saw the wind, boisterous, he was afraid. And he began to sink. He did the conceivable. And the conceivable is to doubt. In the face of a situation I don't understand, I can't explain, it's conceivable for me to doubt. And so Peter starts to doubt. How am I doing this? You are doing it, Peter, by faith, not by ability or skill or knowledge. You're doing it by faith. But when he starts to reason and to rationalize, he doubts. And once he begins to doubt, he then does the expectant. He starts to sink because God responds to faith. So it's his faith in Jesus Christ that was enabling him to perform this miraculous stunt. But when he been, began to doubt, he began to question, he began to sink. And then he does the hopeful. He starts to pray. He saw us to pray. Verse 30b, it says, when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to seek. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. Save me. It's a prayer of hope. It's a prayer of hope. And what we, we must understand, that in, in, in our doubt, we still can exercise faith because all prayer is, is an exercise of faith. And so Peter now reactivates his faith. He believed that Christ is able to save him, and his faith is based on his past experiences with Christ. And so he cries out to the Lord, hopefully, Lord, save me. And he experiences the desirable. He's rescued. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou little faith, Wherefore didst thou doubt? And then again, he does the impossible. He walks on water. This is a cycle that we would often find ourselves dealing with. We find ourselves in frustrating situations that overwhelm us with fear and doubt and uncertainty to where we believe that we're going to be consumed 
by the situation. And then somewhere there, there's a glimmer of faith and a glimmer of hope that is activated, and we cry out to God. And God, through his miraculous divine hand, is able to intervene and to raise us up and to lift us up and give us a place. So I start by to tell you this morning that even when we doubt, God does not discard us. Even when we question, even when our faith fails us in a time of a trial or a test, and we fail the test that God puts before us, if we will still cry out, Lord, forgive me, have mercy on me, save me, God will still rescue us and deliver us, and he will try us again. And so in this little story here, we see this progression from frustration to fear to an activation of faith to failure to a restoration of faith. And they're brought to a fuller, more mature faith. Every time God does something in our life, it should strengthen our faith. It should take us to another level. We have a tendency to keep a short memory of the things that God has done for us. No, we must catalog these things in our memory, write them down if necessary, lest we forget the great things that God has done for us in the past. It is the past, it is the past that we bring back to our mind to remind us of God's faithfulness to us. And we vicariously relive those faith adventures with God and we remind him of how powerful he is, how loving and how gracious he is, and it will strengthen us in the present moment to endure what we're going through, knowing that God is still able to deliver us and to rescue us. And so their faith is matured through this endless pool experience. Their faith is strengthened, it is developed, it is out of the frustration and the fear, and then seeing Christ show up in a miraculous way and see Peter experienced a divine miracle. It strengthens our faith. So if you read the text a little bit further, in verse 32, it says, When they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of truth, thou art the Son of God. See, sometimes we want to be delivered just because we want to be delivered. We want to be rescued just so we can be rescued. We want the pain to end just so we can have relief. We want the frustration to cease just so we will not be frustrated. But the reason that God brings an end to pain and frustration and hardship is that we would know it was by his divine hand and that we might see him in a new and a profound way and that we might worship him and adore him and give him the glory and the praise, the adoration and the thanksgiving and ascribe to him the victory that others around us might see that truly we believe that this is indeed the Son of God. And so it, had they not had this frustrating experience, their faith would not have grown to the depth that it had grown to. And they would not be in a position to believe God to do bigger things, grander things in the future. Well, as we stand on the, the precipice of this new year, as the curtain falls on 2012, over the next day or so, you'll have to take some time and just get by yourself and think about the things that God did for you and how, how God blessed you and how God blessed your family and blessed your friends and how God has provided for you and you'll see the good hand of God in your life in 2012. And it can serve as a catapult to launch you into 2013 where you will leave God for bigger things, for greater things. The fact that God did not wipe you out last year because you failed him or to give you hope to renew your commitment to him this year. Because God took care of your children last year, and none of them were taken from you, should strengthen you 
and cause you to be more faithful in the raising and rearing of your children this year. If you're blessed enough to have your parents still with you on this side of glory, you're to thank God and bless him and show your appreciation by a greater devotion to them in the coming year. If you had a chance to serve God through the church this last year and you didn't really take advantage of that opportunity, you're to thank God that he's given you 2013 where you can right that wrong. With the turning of the calendar, it becomes a, another opportunity for us to recalibrate our spiritual lives and recommit ourselves to the one that we say we know and love. We say who died on the cross for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. We re renew our commitment to him, our devotion to him, that the world might see and know that there is a remnant of people who still believe that God is God all by himself. And as the choir saying earlier, a God who's still doing great things. Well, I'm about out of my time this morning because y'all ate too much sweet potato pie, too much coconut cake, too much turkey and dressing, and too much ham, and you know you shouldn't be eating that ham. You know you shouldn't be eating it with your blood pressure as high as it is. <laughs> a few lessons for you here. Just a couple of little simple lessons. Number one, that life is full of frustration. Life is full of frustration. Job said that man is born of woman is just full of trouble. <laughs> As the sparks fly up, what he says. Life is full of frustrations. And frustration can lead us to fear and to doubt. If we're not careful to become bitter and resentful. And we must guard against that. Regardless of how difficult the moment, how frustrating the hour, we must not succumb to despair and hopelessness. When frustrated and fearful, we must exercise the little bit of faith we got left. Just a little bit of faith. And all, all it takes is a little bit of faith to rescue us from the doldrums of frustration and from the doldrums of fear. <laughs> you know, my, my youngest daughter, absolute nut. Absolute insane. And uh, she just had me in stitches every time, I, every time I'm around. I'm just, I laugh so hard, my stomach just hurts. And I was talking to her the other day, and, and she got two dogs. And I said, well, why, why do you need two dogs? She said, well, Dad, I need them for protection. You got two old mean dogs. I need them for protection, protecting myself. I said, well, you know, I said, well, maybe you need to get a, a, a gun. She said, no, no, I don't need no gun, Dad. She said, she said, she said Dad, I'm off. She said, I'm off, Dad, I'm off. You give me a gun, I'm going to shoot somebody I shouldn't shoot. I don't need no gun. I said, well, scratch that. Let's get you a third dog. <laughs> Maybe we can get you a third dog. I said, that. my point is this, that frustration and fear can lead us to do things that we shouldn't do. Lead us to do things that we shouldn't do. And so we should know our potential, know our own potential to do st destructive things. And so we must guard ourselves to where we keep ourselves from drifting into places where we could do destructive things, you see. So she was reminding me, Dad, don't get me no gun. Get me another dog. <laughs> we must not let fear and frustration drive us to do destructive things. We must exercise our faith and believe God. And then finally, we must always remember that Jesus Christ will always reward faith. Faith always gets rewarded. That is a biblical principle. He that comes to God must believe that God is and that God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him, Hebrews 11, 6 says. God will always honor faith. If you keep your faith in God and your hope in God, he will not disappoint. He will always honor that faith. And God's honoring our faith is God's way of helping us to release the frustration and the fear and the bitterness and the resentment as we're reminded that God really is in control. He really is in control. 
He really is watching over everything. And all the bad things the bad people are doing and think they're going to get away with it. They're not going to get away with it. God is watching. God is watching. And God may not judge at the end of every day, but in the end, he will judge. And your faith in him is what can enable you to refrain from taking judgment in your own hands. And the reason God doesn't want us to judge is because we don't know how to meet it out just right. But we might give too much and we might give too little. And that's why the scripture says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I shall repay. I shall recompense. So as we conclude 2012, let us by faith ask the Lord to help us to release our frustration, to release our fear, our anxieties, bitterness, and resentment that has grown up inside of us over this last year or for many years. And ask the Lord by faith, Lord, help me to release that to you and allow you to replenish my soul and my mind and my spirit. What I really need to go into this new year with the right mind, that this year would not be a wasted year, worrying about something that happened to me last year or the year before that I can really move forward in the destiny that you have for me. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's bow together, shall we? Father, we thank you. Thank you for your people that are here today, the families that are represented. 